The high voltage module explorations are continuing. My apologies if you're getting ozone fatigue and ionizer fatigue, but here is a common enough cheapy Chinese module. You stick, in this case, 220 volt in, and this one has loads and loads of emitters sort of as pairs. And you sometimes see this if you open things like air conditioners or room fan units, you'll find that in the duct that the air comes out, you'll find one of these little, little modules poking through, and it's the ionizer function. And I thought initially when I bought this one that it would be, I, th I was quite intrigued by these because I actually bought it really because I wanted these little sort of spacer things that with the carbon fibre emitters just pre-made, it was just a convenient way to get them. And I thought they might have been all individual resistors to spread the load, but if you bring in a meter and you stick it to continuity, then every single one of these carbon fibre going to have to hold on my fingers because uh, it's quite hard making a contact on the side carbon fibre. You'd think it'd be really conductive, but they're all just basically, they're all just common together. Because I kind of thought, is there a reason they're in pairs and also, are they divided, but they're not. But uh, then I saw another module that looked like this, and it had the same little plastic assembly, the same little carbon fibre clusters, but it had individually coloured wires going up, and I thought... Are they, have they just used green and white because it's what they had? Or is there a reason for that? Are they doing something different? And I've got one of the modules through. It operates at 12 volts. Normally I'm wary about these modules that operate at 12 volts because a normal ionizer like this one creates a very high voltage with, to its circuitry with reference to ground. But uh, this one does appear to have, it appeared to have a positive charge on one and a negative charge on the other. So I decided to depot it. Um, I had two of these, so I, well, I bought one to depot fundamentally, and it took a while to depot. Uh, it contains interesting stuff. Here, if you want to have me go at reverse engineering it, is the two layers of the circuit board. Um, interesting, the text is, I, I was going to say, interesting the text is one way round and text is the other way round. I have just done an absolutely massive boo-boo. I was up late last night doing some high voltage design. I submitted a circuit board to GLCPCB, completely with a spelling error right on the front. It's a, you'll see that when it arrives. But if you want to be snapshot of that for reverse engineering it, not that you're going to see an awful lot. Um, I had to take all the components off. It was the only way to actually get that because uh, just the way it was all covered in resin and stuff was so close and the last few components were trapping the resin in. So we have the incoming positive supply. It goes through a diode and it goes to a smoothing capacitor or just general local capacitor. I shall finish finish this drawing. Hold on, where's the blue pen? I shall finish this by colouring that one in like with one of my crayons. So that's a 220 megfarad capacitor. Uh, it goes to this little transformer, a very neat little transformer. It's the multi-section secondary. It looks as though it's got actual a priming, primary section, then it's got three secondary sections. And then there's a transistor, and then just uh, associated with that, there are one, two, three, four surface mount components with the feedback winding. It's very low current. Let me just hook this up to a bench supply, and I'll tell you what the current is. It's ridiculously low for a little 12 volt circuit like this. So here's positive on, here's negative on. The current is 14 milliamps. This thing is now producing ozone at the tip because that, it turns out that's what it does. 14 milliamps at 12 volts is ridiculous. That makes it viable to use something like this on its own tiny little solar panel in remote locations for keeping places fresh. The transformer couples across uh, to the high voltage winding. Here is the high voltage winding. Uh, I'll call that sec, high V, high V. Uh, this is the primary, and this is the feedback. Um, and that goes over to a couple of uh, little tiny 100 picofarad, 6,000 volt capacitors, and equally tiny little high voltage diodes. Interesting, I've not found these exact diodes. It's, it's quite odd. They have a little pattern at the end that I'll show you afterwards. Well, I'll show you it now. If you can imagine the diode, there's the diode. Uh, at the end, they've got little pattern of arrows in the end, but no text on it. That might be because the text is maybe conductive, because it's metallic, I'm not really sure. But that is a chamfered pattern. The pattern indicates its voltage rating. Very, very strange. I didn't know that until today. 
So there's a capacitor here, capacitor there, and then the diode going across like that. And one to create a little volt voltage multiplier. Then there's a 20 mega ohm resistor and a 10 mega ohm resistor. I wonder why they chose 20 mega ohm for that one. And they've got HP high voltage, and then what I guess is high voltage ground, and it's basically creating its own ground on that side. There is a position for another resistor that would couple it to the primary, but they're not using that. I wonder if this is a multi-use circuit board. Let me bring in the schematic and show you this. I shall zoom down on this. The schematic. The incoming supply goes via diode. That's nice. Then it's got the local fil filtering, smoothing, general sort of reservoir capacitor for stability, probably to prevent noise. Just circuit stability more than anything else. It's got the primary winding of that transformer, quite a low uh, impedance. Uh, and then it's going to the transistor. The transistor is a C2383, which is rated 160 volts for gain with a gain of 150. It's probably rated for that high voltage. Um, just because of the, when it turns off, it could go quite spiky. But that's what they've used. Um, the feedback winding, it comes via a little feedback network. So that initially when it starts uh, turning this transistor on, uh, so initially when you turn it on, current will flow through the feedback wind. It will go through that 30K resistor and that 100 ohm resistor and it will gradually turn this transistor on. As soon as current starts flowing, it will couple it back into the feedback winding. As the current suddenly starts increasing from that, you get a, a fairly high current will be coupled directly through this capacitor for the start of each feedback cycle and limited by this 100 ohm resistor. And this little capacitor here is probably for stability and timing. But then once uh, this capacitor is fully charged, the current goes through 30k resistor. So I think it's just to increase the efficiency of the circuit uh, in its oscillation. Uh, it's a specialist area, high frequency oscillators like this. It's covered across to the secondary winding, which is the high voltage, and across that you've got a basic little voltage multiplier. I would th thought maybe you could do it differently, but here is that effectively, the, what did they call it? They called it uh, HG, and this is HV, because this is the high voltage one. And that goes to the carbon fibre cluster emitters. So one end of the coil just goes straight there. The other goes through the step-up uh, arrangement with the multiplier. I would have thought they might have done that differently to the other connections. So effectively, uh, when I was getting that sort of, I was getting a very strong negative voltage, but I wasn't getting so much of a positive voltage of the meter when I held it in front of the probes. That is presumably because of uh, electrostatic effects and the fact it wasn't directly referenced to the circuit ground. There is a resistor that you can put in, and well, they could put in while manufacturing that would reference it to the ground. That's the one I wouldn't normally recommend adding, and they haven't. But I thought that instead of this arrangement, they could have made it more efficient, perhaps, by doing this arrangement where the secondary had a capacitor connected to each end, and then a diode pointing to one side and a diode pointing to the other, so this end would be the po positive high voltage and this end would be negative, and then they could have used a couple of 10 mega ohm resistors to the output. I don't know why they specifically did that. But when you test this, when you put it into a chamber with a ozone meter, and you turn it on, it does put out a fair amount of ozone, and when you look at it in the dark, you can see the very distinct, uh, in pitch black, particularly with the camera to enhance it, because uh, the cameras can see better than we can, you can see that slight fizzle purple glow on there, and the current flow is effectively, it's not blowing ions out like a typical ionizer, it's all happening between these two clusters, and the high voltage between them means that corona is forming on the surface of those little spiky carbon fibres, and that means means it's effectively, well, it's like a sharp plasma cluster type unit. It's effectively got a positive one, a negative one, although in this instance, one is just grounded and others the high voltage. But it's effectively creating, more than anything else, it's just creating trace ozone. But interesting, it took a while to take apart. I did some of the dissolving of this with acetone. Oh, you, can you see that glowing slate? That's my little glow in the dark 3D printed thing. I think I may feature that in a different video. But, um, it was a, uh, I started off with acetone, the acetone dissolved, well, it softened it to the point that you could get a knife and you could actually just, you could kind of peel the resin off. But um, 
it was just as easy heating it up and then using the acetone because it would only go down, it would only soak into a certain depth and then it just, you'd peel down, then it'd be rock solid again, then you'd have to soak it. And it didn't matter if you left it overnight, it didn't seem to go much beyond much level. It seemed as if it like, once it had uh, gone to a certain depth, it just stopped. But I found that heat was the best thing. And then for the last remnants, uh, I dip in the acetone and just leave it soaking for an hour just to get the last wee bits out. But that's it. So I've been in AliExpress, I've been looking for these tiny little diodes. I've found similar ones, but these ones are 5 millimeters long and they're 1.9 millimeters diameter, so say 5 by 2 millimeter. I didn't find ones that match that. I found ones that are about 10 millimeter by 3 millimeter, which is close enough, but it's not the same thing. And these diodes, it's high voltage, but it's also, they're rated for very fast turnoff. They're designed for use with high frequency oscillators. But that is it. That's the most recent finding and uh, a thorough exercise in depotting that took quite some time. Now I kind of want to depot this one and see what's inside this. Maybe I'll do that later. But that is it. Current progress of investigating interesting Chinese products. Oh, this one came from AliExpress, by the way. I think they do have them on eBay. Um, oh, one thing worth mentioning, if you do run this off a 12-volt DC supply, theoretically, because all the activity is happening between these electrodes, there shouldn't be too much of a, a voltage differential across the supply created, so it might be safe enough to operate with a standard plug-in power supply. I'm not really sure. I'd have to test that. But interesting enough, I've ordered a couple more just because I want to do further experiments with them as the experiments and probing of this technology continues.